We're shaking people. Back with another reaction, back with some more propaganda. We're going back to the sophomore album, Less Talk More Rock. Um, I'll be brief, but I have mentioned before, um, it's a really like pivotal album for me because the first album from Propaganda, How to Clean Everything, um, you know, changed my world, like made me start reading and thinking about things that, you know, were basically unknown to me before that. Um, genuinely like changed my life. And then as I mentioned before, the second album, 1995, a couple years later, came out. I liked it, but there were songs that, you know, just had a different feel, a different sound than the first album. And it was my first experience of like, I love this band. Now they've done something a little bit different. Don't get me wrong. As I mentioned before, there are still several songs on this album, Less Talk, More Rock. Uh, we're going to listen to the vinyl. Um, that are kind of in the, the vein or the flavor of the first album. Um, but generally speaking, it's just a different sort of album. And it took me, I don't know, a few months, maybe a year to like really get on board with it to the same level. But I do love it now, um, or, you know, for a long time. Uh, but bottom line, we're going to listen to a tune called Refusing to Be a Man. Um, it's the final tune on the album. Um, you know, you might be able to guess the content uh, based on the title. Uh, and I, I don't know whether this is Chris or Jord. I feel like it could work in both ways. Um, it does seem to be from the perspective of a straight man rather than a gay man. Um, so I would say maybe it's more Chris. I'm not sure. Uh, but bottom line, um, I think it's applicable, you know, whichever of them wrote it. Um, in terms of, it's the narrator is saying that, you know, as we in the modern, like, human era, and surely, you know, going back before recorded history, uh, but generally speaking, around the world and right up into the present day, um, male perspectives and male dominance in society, male centrality in culture in terms of, like, normative what, you know, genders are supposed to be and what the different sexes are supposed to do and how they're supposed to act, Generally speaking, it's men answering those questions. Generally speaking, it's men dictating and enforcing the answers to those questions to varying degrees, but in culture, in society, in the workplace, in religion and religious context, certainly. Um, and so the narrator is saying that, you know, as he was a kid, he began to feel like he was sort of forced to think it, like this is how boys are supposed to think, and this is how you're supposed to act if you're a tough guy and you don't want to be a wimp and so on. Um, and you know, you're supposed to sort of show how strong you are to the girls and blah, blah, blah. And so all of these sort of tropes and sort of themes and concepts built around traditional, if you will, um, and again, you know, traditions can be very different. So the idea that traditional just means sort of, um, you know, old and conservative, it's complicated. But again, the idea um, is that as this uh, narrator was growing, he felt pressure to conform to sort of like um, long running, you know, again, like as old as humans, um, perhaps like in the modern sort of anatomical concept, uh, where men sort of dominate um, all aspects and, again, dictate what is a man and what a man is supposed to be and do. And the narrator begins to express um, disinterest in that or an inclination to get away from it, a disinclination to just buy into that, though there is a tension because the narrator is also saying, and you know, I'm still a product of that. I'm still, you know, I still have my desires and so on. And I think some of them, you know, mean that like in the wrong context, like I could turn into like someone who commits sexual assault or so on because I had been told that like, you know, when you're with a woman or so on, you're supposed to make a move and you're supposed to like, you know, take charge of the situation. And so he's saying, you know, because of the things that have been inculcated in me about gender, about sex, and about being a man, um, you know, I'm sort of dangerous even though I'm not trying to be. And ultimately, you know, only through trying to really like, um, un, like peel away these layers of socialization and culturalization as it relates to, again, gender roles and sexual identity and so on, only then can I become a more decent person who doesn't like treat people a certain way because of you know what genitalia they have or like how they choose to be addressed in public and so on. Um, and again, I have great sympathy for this song because you know I'm a straight male, but as I grew up, I felt the same way. It was like, okay, yeah, like I like girls and so on, but why does like the male perspective, as if there's one male perspective, have to be like, yes, I am a tough and powerful guy. Like, it just felt like, you know, there are different ways of being a boy. There's different ways of being a man, even again within like a straight context. And that doesn't even take into account different ways to be a man if you're a gay man or a bisexual man or so on. So, 
Um, as I was growing into my like early teens and beginning to listen to propaganda, um, I was already feeling these things that like, okay, yeah, like I'm straight, but that doesn't mean that I need to like flex my muscles or constantly talk like, oh, I'm gonna like hook up with that girl or whatever. It was more like, yeah, okay, you know, she's really cool. I'd like to spend more time with her, but like, you know, I'm not gonna like project like this masculinity. Like to me, masculinity can be represented and manifested in many different ways. So I have great sympathy with this song when I heard it. And like I said, one of the reasons um, or I don't know if I said it in this video, I think I did in another one, but one of the reasons that I started coming around on this album and like, yeah, you know what, this really is a fucking fantastic propaganda album, um, is the ideas in a lot of the songs, it's the lyrics, and I remember this one, it wasn't a song that stood out right away, you know, I listened to the album and I was like, wow, that's different, you know, a couple songs at the beginning felt like how to clean everything, but I gotta listen to it again. Eventually, though, the final tune did stick out, and it's like, wow, you know what, um, yeah, I sympathize with this because I've long felt like, okay, I'm a boy, I'm growing into a man, but don't you tell me what that means. I'll let you know what that means to me. And obviously it means different things to me because I, you know, try to treat people respect, I with respect. I try to not, you know, judge someone based on like, you know, how long their hair is or again, like what body parts they have. So um, I sympathize with the song a great deal. Musically, it's sort of like a more of a ballad kind of tune from them. I mean, it's a punk rock tune, but it's it's a bit slower. It's not like muck raking and ripping. It's more like, you know, melodic, if you will. So yeah, it's, it's a bit more of a ballad if, you know, Propagandi does ballads. Um, so let's get to it. This is Propagandi um, on Fat Records, their second album, Less Talk, More Rock, 1995. And the last tune on the album, Refusing to Be a Man. Oh. See, it's, it lies. This thing lies. Okay, so this is Refusing to Be a Man, yes? Yes. Motherfucker. Texas tragedy.
I have no evidence to support this. It feels sonically uh, like a tune that would work with uh, John Sampson singing, even though it is Chris singing. So I feel like you know maybe that's a song that like the sonics were at least worked out in part uh, by John, um, who was about to leave the band at this point, as many of you will know. Um, this was his last uh, album that where he was on, uh, where he was in the group. Uh, their next album, uh, Today's Empire's Tomorrow's Ashes, uh, Todd had come in. Um, and again, many of you will know, and I know Jimmy in particular and I have talked about it, um, that transition, I think it's a very like important moment for the band. And again, I like increasingly respect what John K. Simpson, John K. Sampson brought to the band. Um, you know, it, he always felt kind of like the, the part of the band that, you know, was the least like involved in the songwriting and so on. Because again, um, there was only one song that he sung on on the first album, um, and it's only part of the song, and then on the second album, this one, he only sings on one song. Um, so it felt like he was kind of like the least significant member of the group in terms of like what the band was doing. Um, but over the years, like since I've come to, and especially since I've come to do these uh, reactions, um, I think I've come to realize more uh, what he was doing in the group beyond just playing the bass. So. Um, yeah, bottom line, shout out to John K. Sampson, but again, as uh, Jimmy and I, and I think Ryan also have talked about, like, Todd coming into the group, it was like a really big moment, um, it sort of changed the sonic flavor of the group, they began to have, like, harder, like, more, like, metal-influenced, um, melodic, hardcore sort of sound, moving away from kind of the thrashier, like, skate punk of certainly the first album and this one, um, to a lesser extent. Um, but yeah, bottom line, um, I do enjoy that song and it just felt like, you know, maybe this is a song where like John could sing and it feel, it would feel like, you know, like an anchorless sort of song. Um, but yeah, I really do enjoy the lyrics of that one. Uh, let me know what you think. Uh, I do apologize. I know in like punk rock videos more than any other style, I do talk a lot. So, uh, apologies there, but do let me know what you think. Other than that, I'll see you next time.